Let's just talk about uh, French cuisine. I, I really have some good pictures. I, I hope this builds an appetite for lunch after this. So this is a really, timing was this is really perfect. Uh, so I've done a variation of this talk before. Uh, I'm probably not going to do that after this one, so you guys are lucky ones. Uh, this talk is about, uh, about various things. Actually, this is kind of an unusual. I don't know whether I should put play there, because uh, we're going to talk about mainly what I have learned building reactive applications. So we're going to see lots of interesting architectures here. And uh, most of the examples going to involve uh, play, ACA, Slake, whatever. Okay, so uh, I'm going to do a quick poll here. Uh, is how many of you are comfortable with play here? Uh, okay, that's wonderful. ACA? Okay, this is a perfect question because I'm not going to talk about what those frameworks are. I'm just going to dive in. Uh, so like I said, this is going to be about uh, about looking at how people are using uh, Play, Aka, and the TypeSafe stack essentially to build reactive applications. So my job with TypeSafe is uh, kind of interesting. I do lots of stuff, lots of stuff, and travel a lot too. But one of the things I like about working with TypeSafe is the consulting aspect, which, take, which takes me to various teams, various places, helping teams building large scalable applications. And some of these examples we're going to take a look at today is kind of that. And uh, most of the talk will be very interactive, so I'm going to ask you questions, and we're going to, and we're going to start from there, okay? So the first thing we're going to talk about is essentially back pressure. And this is some of the interesting aspect that I get to see, I get to solve essentially on various uh, places. So what is back pressure? This is kind of a test. <laughs> what is black back pressure? Okay, so back pressure essentially is, it, is putting pressure against the flow. So if the, if the data flow is coming down like this, you're putting pressure upwards. Okay? Now let's see where this could be interesting. So I'm gonna give you a, I'm gonna start with a very simple example where there is a solution out there, an example where there isn't a solution. So let's look at this question here. This is actually very uncomfortable. All right, so let's look at this question here. Is that how should a system respond when under sustained load? Okay, if you're monitoring your application, this is what the graph looks like. A hockey stick goes up. What do you think happens to the system or how you want your system to respond in that kind of scenario? As usual, pictures should be as usual. Essentially, most of the time, system actually crash. <laughs> so, how we should handle load is a good example of back pressure. So, let's take an example of this simple example. We have cute cat pictures. Everybody loves cat pictures, right? So, we have this nice cat picture website. What happens here is that people take nice pictures of their kitties and upload them. Now, this is a very simple application. What we essentially do is, since it's a it's a startup. We take all these uh, images and stream it back to the cloud storage. Let's call it S3. Okay? Now, sometimes what happens is client is on a faster internet connection. Okay? So client is uploading its image by 5 Mbps. Okay? But for some reason, that day, S3 is acting weird, it's slow. So I can only stream upwards on two MBPS per second. What should I do? This is an example of that sustained load. Obviously, this is a very popular site. Everybody likes cat pictures. I get lots of images upwards. But for a, for a certain point of time or a day, my history is slow. It's not able to catch up with all the data that I'm getting. How should I handle this? One more time. To allow only two megabytes from the upcoming Okay, so I, I got a couple of answers, so can I stick with that? Well, first answer I had was buffering. So buffering is a good idea when you 
for temporary situations. For an example, let's say this, this does happen, so it happens suddenly for two minutes. Otherwise, this screen is very, behaves very well. It can keep up with all the data I'm sending in. But suddenly, for some point, it's slower. For, for a fraction of a minute or two minutes, a small amount of time. Then buffering actually works. But buffering really doesn't scale. How much I can buffer? Right. So another interesting, what else do I have? What other options you guys can think of here? It's a simple upload, guys. Throttle. What? Throttle. throttle. How can I throttle this guy? Throttle boom, by the way. This guy here, right? So you're saying, hey, since I can only handle two Mbps, is there a way I can slow this guy down? How can I do that? It's an HTTP simple upload, yeah. Somebody is being put here. You just you enter back at me and you go to the So one of the aspects that, that TCP provides, which is HTTP or builds on, is something called TCP back pressure. Okay, TCP has this back pressure built in. We don't have to do anything. All I have to do in the receiver buffer, in my socket buffer here, if I stop reading data from this buffer, this will be back pressure will kick in. So, so wait a minute, this guy is not reading data. Please don't send me data back. And that pressure goes all the way to gateway, all the way whatever continents is there, go to this user's Chrome browser and scroll the browser. So this is a classic example where you had a problem and solution is just right there. So in play, we essentially abstract that out with something called iterating. Okay? So iterating allows us to do that modeling where we say step. Okay? So what's happening here? Fold operation. We are used to fold operation. We are Scala developers, right? Fold. What fold allows us to do? Fold allows us, us to pass a function in which function, this function will get invoked when some data is available right here, okay? And the iterative abstraction here, play has something asynchronous version of it. What that means is that when it's sending a data, let's say that the receiver buffer right here, in receiver buffer, I'm reading one byte, okay? Just think about it. It's more than one byte. When I'm reading one byte, I'm calling this function. Hey, I have a data for you. Can, you. can you run with it? Do whatever you like. And this future I will be doing is pushing the data to S3. The beauty of this model is, unless this completes, I am not going to get one more data element. So if this is slow, that means my receiver buffer is feeding up here. That means it automatically is going to create a back pressure. Any questions? The way it looks at in the code, I don't know whether we have time for this. Can everyone see this? Should I make it bigger or smaller? Maybe? Yeah, bigger, bigger. How do you make bigger? All right, so the way the abstraction works here is, are we all comfortable with play here? That's what I heard. So play action, action, action takes a, a, a parameter called body parser, okay? Play is essentially very lazy. It's not going to read anything unless it's required to read. And body parser is a mechanism that using which you can say, okay, read the body of the request. So the way the play parses the request is that it's going to read the header. If the header matches some sort of routes file, then we say, okay, I'm going to go in and read the body. Okay? So this body, body parser, is nothing but that folding right there. Okay? The folding that we just saw in the slide. What I'm doing here is that in the fold, I'm saying, uh, my input is an array of bytes. What I'm essentially count, uh, calculating here is number of uh, number of uh, number of uh, chunks I'm getting back, which is an integer. I just lost my pointer here, which is an integer. Okay. So play has this built-in mechanism already. 
If this guy is slower, it will automatically create the back pressure. So the way I'm scaling here in this case is that obviously the user experience will go a little bit go down because the user will think, why, why after this taking so long now? But you're not crashing. Assuming this H3 happens temporarily, you pick up the slack and things will get better. All right, so let's look at the another scenario here. Most of my pre this presentation is actually five mini presentation. <coughs> let's gallop there. All right, so this is one thing I had to do for a customer where they do real-time traffic analysis. Okay, I'm imagining you guys are interested in distributed applications. Otherwise, this will be very boring. <laughs> okay, so what happens here is that they have many GPS sources. Which, which continuously push data, okay? The objective of this application is take all this data, do analysis right here, okay? And tell you that, hey, if you're taking A5 right now, from this position, this location to that location, it will take 20 minutes because based on the current traffic. We all use that, okay? Your GPS devices or your or radio stations, all this, their customers is uh, XM radio or GPS devices because they give real-time traffic analysis data. Okay? Now let's look at this example here where all this data comes into the rabbit entity because for legacy reasons they have other external system integrated to that. Okay? And this data comes in and they have some sort of routing mechanism which is consistent hashing. Okay? Because they have one caches here. Okay, best one let's say, okay, this is for, for Chicago. If it's if this traffic data is for Chicago, we're gonna send it to this node here. Okay? Now what what play application does here is that it takes that uh, traffic data and pushes to ACA where we do all the computation, figures out that what real time traffic was, the traffic looks like, how much time it's gonna take for this distance. Simple enough? Now let's understand the problem. The problem is Sometimes there is a huge event burst. What do I mean by burst is a spike of data coming in, could jump. This is a very typical problem. For an example, guilt.com. How many of you know guilt.com? Okay, it's an e-commerce site. They get tra traffic spikes every day from 12 to 1. Because that's when they run the deal. Amazing traffic spikes. It almost doubles 20 times the number of requests they usually get. Okay, so that kind of spikes, it happens all the time when you're building applications like this. Okay, now let's imagine this. There is always an X amount of time it takes to process the data. I cannot, I cannot improve that, that's what it takes. Okay, now all these events busts coming in, I'm pushing this event in rates higher than it can handle. What will happen? What will happen if I start pushing uh, a number of messages that the app cannot handle? Does anyone know what's the default mailbox implementation of app? Unbounded. Okay. So if I don't keep up with this events, my mailbox will keep queuing up messages. And it could happen that it will throw out the memory error. Now there is another interesting aspect to this architecture. That is, I said it's real time. That means there is a TTL with my messages. Who cares about traffic data, what happens five minutes back? I care what's going to happen for the next five minutes, right? So there is a time sensitivity of the messages as well that if I have a message in my mailbox which is 10 minutes older, there is no point processing that message. What do you do? The typical TCP back pressure will not work because if I put back pressure, first of all, this guy doesn't understand. But if I put back pressure, what's happening? I'm saying, don't send me the latest event, which is kind of the opposite of what I This is where the built-in solutions are not there. 
What we could do here, I mean, anybody have any idea? I really want to make this interactive. Mm -hmm. Bounded queue. Let's talk about if it's a bounded queue. Any, anybody knows what bounded queue implementation looks like in Hacker? The bounded queue implementation is that let's say you say bounded, that means you have to specify the size of the mailbox. Let's say 100 for simplicity, okay? Now, if the message box is filled with 100 messages, the person of the sender who's trying to enqueue the 101st message, 101 message, that sender call will be blocked. But we don't want to block. Because if I block, then I'm not, good. I'm not getting the latest GPS messages. So this... Google messaging don't process it. What is that? Google messaging don't process it. Throw it away and go to the next one. Does it help? It will help, yeah. So this is an, another alternative of back pressure. There is a mini implementation of back pressure. I do have to implement back pressure here. But my, my uh, back pressure implementation would be Lucy, that means I need to start dropping messages. Because if because my implementation should be, I should I should try my best to process the latest messages I have in my mailbox. Because that's what's going to give me the real data that this guy cares about. Now, Akas stream is trying to solve something, so essentially what we need is bounded non-blocking mailbox, which actually doesn't exist right now. Except with Delta, I did something like <laughs> But Akas stream is going to get something like this. We need an implementation. So the way I solve this problem here is using a ring buffer. So my mailbox implementation, I have to create a custom mailbox implementation here which is also very easy. It's almost like 10 characters you need to type in in your hacker, that's it. And this was very interesting because as the messages was queuing in, I let it overwrite the whole messages. So that I made sure I'm bounded. It has a clear number of the size, I mean, how many, how many messages I can handle, plus I always kept up with the latest messages. Any questions? Okay, um, so the way, uh, there, is a, there is an implementation called MDBQ in GitHub. The way it works is that I've created a mailbox back by an array. Okay, I have two pointers in an array, head and tail. And I make sure that it, it modulates up, it goes back and it subtracts over and over again. What's happening here is that when it's trying to add new data element, there might be an old message here which haven't processed. But I let it overwrite the old message. It was the oldest message in the mailbox, if that makes sense, and keep going back. But here is another example of where I'm losing messages, actually, and that was fine with the customer because they want to process the latest one. Now we're going to take an example where we will do see some code, and I think that would be useful. Uh, but anyway, if you want to do something like this, the way you should do it is... Uh, Mailboxes that, like that, you just say, hey, a request message queue, and the implementation is non blocking bounded mailbox. That's enough for a hacker to switch the mailbox. All right, let's take another example which I'm really proud of uh, an Internet of Things example. Okay? This example is about precision farming. Uh, I, I know we are into computers and we don't look into farm fields, but farm fields have been innovating for a long time now. Most of the tractors out there can run self. They have an iPad built in, which can talk to the server, and from server you can, you can actually instruct the machine how to plow the field. It's called precision farming. There are companies out there which is doing it. Now this is a very interesting uh, project in the sense, 
First of all, the numbers are gigantic. We're talking about millions here, okay? And uh, so there are millions of devices. You can, you can replace this with any device if you want, okay? And coming to this, uh, this router, which is an abstraction over many other nodes and, and modules and, and, and uh, so software components. But essentially what happens is that this router forwards to this uh, play nodes, which essentially compose a play plus app, okay? Like that they could, could have hundreds of nodes in the cluster. All of them are part of the cluster, okay? Now a couple of interesting design decisions here. First, when these tractors run, sometimes the job, when they plow the field, the abstraction is called job. They're doing a job. Sometimes the jobs could run for months, okay? Big field, it could run for months, okay? And like that, there could be many jobs running in parallel. The first abstraction, an interesting abstraction we did for this project was take this job and abstract it as an actor. Now this is a very interesting thing I see over and over again is that people are completely using in memory. So all the information that these jobs are doing are represented in memory as an actor. So each of the job is an actor running somewhere in the cluster. Okay? Now these are the jobs have accumulated state as well. Okay, as they are running, it's accumulated states. Because some of the states gets fit into, they have a nice dashboard where you can see how their jobs are running. Now, actors are very lightweight. This is the perfect way to build an abstraction modeling also. But the point is, actors, since there are so many jobs, I cannot possibly hold all these actors in a single node. It's impossible for me. I don't have enough RAM to do that. So uh, what I did here is that, or the way the project is done here is that those actors are distributed in separate nodes. Okay? Now the challenges. The challenges, first challenge is I need to figure out, so let's say I created a job. Let's say for this guy I have a job running in this node. Now, let's say after five minutes this guy wants to send his data, saying, okay, I've updated this job. My first challenge is, I don't know where that actor is running in cluster. First problem, location, where, how can I find it? Second problem is, what happens if this node crashes? And third problem is, okay, let's say that, a location problem, how can you solve that? I have so many actors that I can possibly hold in a single box. That's why I'm distributing in, in a cluster. But the downside of that is I have no idea where my actors are running. Has anyone built applications like this here? Uh, the interesting aspect of building stuff like this is that Akka has a very interesting uh, component called Akka Cluster Sharding. Okay, obviously you probably have thought about this already. Since I have so many actors in my, in my application, I need to start grouping them out. I need to figure out, okay, I need to take this group and deploy it some other group because I cannot possibly hold them in memory. Okay, that's one. The benefit of cluster sharding is when this all applications are part of a cluster, <laughs> then what happens is that we have this cluster shard running on each node. And they kind of talk to each other. So for an example, when this, let's say for this guy actor is running here, I can have this uh, tractor send request to any node in the cluster, any node randomly. That means I'm actually not getting very close up here. I can follow to any node. And this sharding component that sits here, I'm going to show you some code for this, sits here, figures out, huh, this actor is running on node number three. Let me forward this request to node number three. Okay? So that takes care of my location transparency problem. The second problem I have is node crashes. So my actor has accumulated state, and that state is kind of very important for me. I really need to know how much my tractor has done the job so that I can continue further. 
For that, there is an interesting component in uh, ACA called ACA persistence. And we use ACA persistence to kind of solve that problem. And third interesting aspect of this is that when I say the jobs can run for months, that doesn't mean it's running 24 by 7. Sometimes it goes down. Okay, it might stop for a week not doing anything. Now, that, and the interesting aspect of this, if that happens, is it worthwhile to keep that actor in memory for a week not doing anything? It's actually consuming resources. Well, let's look at some code now. Any questions, though? How about now? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we created this actor system here. And, uh, and after creating an actor system, the first thing we're doing is something called create sharding. Do you remember the shard region? This is a guy's company, like a proxy, who sits on every node and keeps track of where the actors are running. It's a part of the country library of Aga. It's pretty awesome. And, and essentially, at the stop, we are shutting down the actor system. It's not a big deal. Okay, the way shard work, the most important aspect of this example here is from line number 27 to 32, actually. So what I'm doing, yes, right. How do you shard? What is the key of the I am going to get to that, right? Yes, good question. Uh, so what I'm using is that I'm, I'm creating this cluster sharding component. Remember, every time I'm running a play server, this on start gets called, and this code gets executed on every node I have. All right, you good in there? Okay. So when I played uh, creating cluster sharding here, and for the start method, the uh, first thing I figured out is that what's a shard method? It could be anything. In my case, it's attractors. <coughs> Let's look at that quickly. Yeah, it's just called tractors because you can have many shards in your application. All right, next thing we do is that we say this shard that, hey, when a request comes in, I started my application. I have no actor run. And tracker starts its job in the morning. OK? It sends its first request. The request always comes to sh cluster sharding. So sharding needs to know how to create the job. That's exactly what I'm doing here. I'm saying sharding, when you get a request, this is my props, and this is how you create an tracker job string. So good? All right. So the next thing I have is an ID extractor. What is ID extractor? ID extractor is a way I can, I let the shard know that, hey, when you get the message, shard needs to figure out how can I extract the ID from the message. You need to have an ID. I'll show you why the ID is important. So if you look at there, I am doing this code. I'm saying is all the types of messages my job stream can handle extend this job message. And job message has an abstract member called job ID. By the way, you should have been deaf here if, you, if I follow best practices. Anyway, it's a job ID. And what I'm doing in the ID extractor, ID extractor is nothing but a partial function. It says when Shark gets a message, it says, okay, I have to figure out what's the ID of this message. It calls your ID extractor to extract that ID. Make sense? Okay? It creates a tuple of your job ID and the message. And the shard resolver, which is the next parameter, which kind of figures out that how should I shard your actors? Okay, what would be the number? How should I group them? What's the grouping logic? This is kind of defines what's the grouping logic of that shard. 
Any questions? All right, next thing I do is that uh, I created a journal. Yes. Five, five minutes. Five more minutes I have? And that's how you do No, sorry, 15, <laughs> 15, 15. 15 minutes, thank you very much. Okay, uh, and every, uh, and I remember I told you that when actors accumulate state, I need to make sure the state stays the same. Because what's going to happen if you look at this code here? The way I have implemented, if it works correctly, if this node goes down for some reason, okay? What will happen is that, let's say there was an actor running for this job here. It's going to come in, obviously this node is down, so it's not part of the cluster. So the request can come into any node. And that node will figure out, okay, is there an actor which represents this? If it's not, that actor will get created any other available node. Okay? And since I'm using ACA persistent, which is an, another way of implementing even sourcing, when that actor will be recreated on this node here, all the messages from this journal will be replayed on that actor. So this actor crashes here, it comes back on this node, all the messages get replayed, that actor is back on that old state. And then this shard will follow the message to this. It's almost like magical. This actually holds on to the message unless that actor is recreated and then it's going to follow the message. Okay, since I have a 15 minutes, a quick poll for you guys. Do you guys want to go through this or do you want me to show another interesting path? Huh? All right, so this is, uh, this is, I have done something for, uh, for LinkedIn. I can talk about this publicly. Right? How many have you seen this presentation? Uh, so let's look at this, let's analyze this homepage a little bit here. Okay, what's happening here is that the homepage obviously has four components. Okay? And each of these components are backed by a microservice. There is a service out there, a service. LinkedIn essentially is completely based on REST services. Okay? In fact, each of those boxes, let's say, who viewed my profile, jobs you might be interested. I mean, if you have a LinkedIn profile, you probably have those things here. And this is your feed. Okay? All these are managed by individual things. There are teams out there who's doing that for you. Okay? So when you go to LinkedIn.com, okay, like slash home here, what actually happens? You send a request. <coughs> the request goes to some sort of controller. They're actually using play, by the way. And from controller, you fan out. You you call this. You call all this rest services, right? You call it all this rest services. And each of the services, let's say this is your feed, this is your jobs you might be interested, people who viewed a profile, have different latency characteristics. They're not all running on the same speed, obviously. In fact, the feed is the slowest. The one that takes the maturity of your homepage is actually the slowest one. Why? Because feed is, your feed page is completely different from mine, because it's personalized for you. There's lots of interesting stuff going on to figure it out. Okay? Now, while this is happening, the guy who's sitting here is waiting. Right? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, in, uh, in the Zoom user, I have the impression that these services are responding directly to the browser instead of being uh, mounted. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I will come back to that. The second question. Okay, what what happens? I'm saying now, and what alternative is talking about? I will mention that as well. So anyway, when that happens, then you start. You, once all the services come back, then you start streaming your first byte. Okay, 
then the, then the browser gets the head element, it looks at the script, CSS, it starts downloading the CSS, and once it's done with the CSS, it starts showing things accurately. Okay, that's how, that's how browser renders it. Okay? Now the question is, why do you like this? Why can't I have an Ajax here? So why, why not do this? I call it home page, it immediately come back. And from there, I start making Ajax call to individual services and then display the data. Why not do that? Who, who thinks it's a good idea to do that right? Yeah, it's actually tricky. I, I put it on the desk like that and nobody will say. Okay. Uh, so the reason we didn't use Ajax is because Ajax is runs on the lowest priority thread. I'll tell you what happens. When you send your content here with HTML markup with all the CSS and scripts, what browser will do, browser will first obviously be prior to CSS, that's what it does. Then it's going to download scripts. And finally, say, do I have anything to do? No. Oh, then let me call it Ajax. The downside of this is, you are, if you use Ajax, not only you're doing the last thing after browser is done with everything, you're also calling this service, which is so already making it much more slower. Actually, what we should do here is that whenever request comes in, the first thing we should do is that call the slowest service as soon as possible. Because we know it's going to take a long time to watch this. Make sense? What we ideally need in this kind of scenario is something like this. When a request comes in, uh, every service completes processing the data, we should start sending the response back. Okay, this is something we should do. That means what essentially we have, we should theoretically do here is that whenever a message comes in, first thing we should do is send the head element. Because what we're trying to reduce here is the time to the first byte, because that's very important if you're building applications like this. I mean, we are programmers, we know if the site is slow, we don't bother, we just do control tab and move to another site. Right? It's very important. Amazon has done lots of testing around this. So what's exact, what you should do theoretically is, whenever the request comes in, immediately say the set head element with all the script and CSS you need, so that while your services are working, browser can download the script. We just have to parallelism here. The pattern was first mentioned uh, in a paper by Facebook called Big Pipe. Okay, Facebook does some things like this. Now LinkedIn homepages are doing something. It's actually very trivial to implement this in play. It actually, when, when somebody told me this problem, it actually took a couple of hours to do the first prototype of this. It's a beauty of having nice abstractions. So the way, excuse me, so the way we have done this in, um, uh, in this scenario is, <coughs> let me show you the code. So you guys are familiar with play, right? So play by default understands what types? Play by default understands uh, .html. So the typical views looks like is index.scala.html. Am I right? You look all confused. Yes, right? OK. <laughs> and so what, what it means is that you're writing your, your you can write your Scala code, it finally generates an uh, HTML for you. But have you ever wondered what happens if you put feature inside that HTML? Because that's what service is going to be, right? When I invoke the services, this is how it looks like. Bunch of modules I have, I just named few modules. Each of this module is nothing but feature of HTML right here in line number 34. There is no way I can take this future of HTML and pass it to my index page and say render. So the alternative approach for this is, obviously we need to figure out something called chunking. We all know chunking, actually we want that one chunking. That allows you to stream data, okay? Like I said, first thing you should ideally stream if you're building stuff like this, which 
should be if you're building reactive responsive app because this is ties to your responsiveness, right? Is figure out how quickly I can send data back to the browser so the browser can start doing something. But the biggest challenge of doing something like that is stands your views. Because views are HTML. Somehow we need to figure out, take this idea of view and just say it's a stream of it. And stream of data in play is called enumerators. Okay, enumerator is an abstraction over, okay, this is a stream of data. If I can somehow figure out my page to be an enumerator, then I'm gonna solve this problem. To do that, one thing I did here is, it's very simple, it's actually it's not a big deal, is it's called something called creating a format. Hold on one second. is in play, you can actually extend something called format, which takes space right? Which allows you to do, okay, hey, uh, don't worry about it, I have a new format called page lit. It's not .html anymore, it's my format, <coughs> okay? And here is how you should parse that format. And what I'm essentially doing is, that it's kind of an involved, I don't know whether I'm explaining it correctly, is taking this format and turning it into an anymore. So each byte is streamed as an enumerator, and the beauty of that is, if I if I open this index.html, what I'm doing here is that I'm taking modules, my page leg, which is an abstraction of all the streams. Okay, this is all this stream coming in, and I have no idea in which order the streams will come in, so I'm interleaving them together. Okay, I'm not blocking one; I'm interleaving streams. And I'm passing the stream right here. It's a data stream. <coughs> and the way I've implemented the format, what will happen is that the moment somebody calls this, the main right there, which contains the header, okay, main right here, the first thing that will happen is I'm going to send all that till here as a first jump. When I open the browser, this is exactly what's going to happen. The body will come in. And then this guy content, which is nothing but my index there, is going to spit out everything till div. What I'm doing here is that I'm putting the placeholders. And finally, this guy, this is where the browser will wait. Now, as when the services are completed, that guy will start operating. Let me run this and show you how this works. And I promise this will be the last one. JavaScript templates, so client side templates for rendering. So what we did was that every payload that was coming out of the service, good question, every payload that was coming out of the service had this JSON payload and an inline script, which took the JSON and embedded that in HTML. So if it works properly, I have put an artificial delay on each services. When I do this, you will see First, the divs are, the boxes are appearing, and then it will start filling the contents. This is the exact behavior we want with your screen. All right, since I'm running out of time, any question?
But where is it? You need like 20 lines of code to do, do something what I did just now. Where is it? Uh, in my machine. Sure, <laughs> 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 I can share. Uh, it's actually put it out there in the in the GitHub URL. Is there anywhere where you can do more about it? Uh, search for Facebook Big Five. Big Five. Yes. Then in the context of place. What? Then in the context of place. No, that's general idea. And this was an implementation of that idea. Is there? Is written more written about this in the context of place? Uh, no. I am the context if you ask me. <laughs> Maybe I should write. Okay. Yes. If you are building a JavaScript library, like for example jQuery, before the end of the body, is it loaded before all the models finish loading? It's kind of an interesting, uh, in the body is very relative here this time because in the body is very relative, is that a string? Because remember what's happening here is when I go to this code, uh, up here, the line number 30, I really don't know what that line number 30 is going to look like in the browser. Because that line number 30 is saying I opened a pipe and there will be data streams coming in. And that could be in any order, depending on who, which services finish it fast. If after the modules you have a script loading jQuery, that will be loaded first, yes. So what I did, the technique is you should send your markup as soon as possible. And what modules is doing is essentially going back. As you see, each, each of this module has an ID. What this markup is doing is essentially a, a, Java, a JSON payload, a JavaScript tag, which knows which ID to latch on and fit in the HTML. Any other question? It looks a little bit like a simulation. It is. Any other question about back pressure architecture or anything? Well, thank you. It was. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, regarding your example with the tractor jobs. Yes. So the um, motivation was you can fit it on one machine and these yeah. are long running things. Mm -hmm. uh, did you need to handle the case that there may be too many jobs which can fit on all machines so that you do? some garbage collection to remove all the actors because they are occupying memory because otherwise you have an out of memory error on one of your machines? Yes, uh, so, uh, so the question is when these jobs are running and sometimes they run for months, who is going back and making sure that when jobs stop somebody is cleaning up that actor? Um, yes, so, so obviously they have protocol for this but the most interesting aspect of this is that sometimes in between, while they are running job, the structures can go to sleep for a week. So uh, the sharding has an interesting concept called passivation. So the way uh, we have done this, which was very critical for them actually to implement, is if an actor doesn't receive a message in this for 20 minutes, passivate this. Passivate this. What that means is that that instance of actor will be considered for garbage ownership. This is okay because all the actor state are saved as an even source in a job. Let's say after 20 minutes or, or after 30 minutes somebody sends a message of that actor wakes up and says, oh, I'm, I'm doing my job, here is my data. Because sometimes these actors can, actors can go offline. Then when that happens, that actor cluster sharding will pick up and say, okay, there is no act, uh, actor running for this. Let me start an actor apply all the events so they back to the state and process the message. So it's very critical, you have to have that, that's a very good question. Uh, so it's a normal um, feature that has Yes, it's a Yes. Alright, thank you very much. Thank you very much.